Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Achieving Higher Resolution Protein Impurity Analysis with Microfluidic Capillary Electrophoresis. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by Labberts.com, the leading social media site for science professionals, and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment. Their innovative detection, imaging, informatics, and service capabilities, combined with deep market knowledge and expertise, help customers gain greater insights into their science. Before we start, there are a few instructions. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome, too. And you can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenters. We are proud to welcome James White, PhD, and Anubhav Tripathi, PhD. Dr. White is a senior application scientist in the Applied Genomics Diagnostics Division at Perkin Elmer. His research and development is focused on new product innovations for the Perkin Elmer lab chip assay portfolio and affords new DNA and protein microfluidic capillary electrophoresis applications. James's research experience spans chemistry, polymer chemistry, and biomedical engineering. Prior to joining Perkin Elmer, James was a postdoctoral fellow at Tufts University, where he applied his chemistry background towards the development and analytical characterization of neurological tissue scaffolds. Dr. Tripathi leads a research group at Brown University that develops new pathogen diagnostic platforms by integrating biological and engineering principles. This work has a broad impact on scientists, engineers, physicians, and entrepreneurs. He holds many patents, has over 100 peer-reviewed publications, and has delivered more than 50 invited talks. Dr. Tripathi is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Prior to Brown, he led the development of microfluidics chips for protein and DNA sizing at Caliper Life Sciences, now Perkin Elmer. This technology is sold in more than one million chips a year. The speaker's complete bios are found on the Labroots website. I will now turn it over to Dr. Tripathi for his presentation. Hi, everybody. This is Anubhav Tripathi. Uh, I'm going to, in next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell about some fundamentals uh, behind microfluidic CE or microfluidic capillary electrophoresis and how we can uh, use that for high resolution protein impurity analysis. So I'm going to take you to the next slide. As an overview of microfluidic electrophoresis, we deal with four aspects of it instrument, kits, chips, and software. Here, uh, the instrument is provided by, which is developed by Perkin Emmer. The chip and the kit, which has all the components which we use in a, in a microfluidic chip, is provided by kit. And then microfluidic chip, which is, which I'll tell you more about it, and go deep dive on that, is the engine for this microfluidic electrophoresis. And of course, everything is controlled by a quantitative software, which I'll tell you about it. We can uh, use this, these four components to perform many uh, microfluidics assays, but I would like to focus on proteins today, where we're going to emphasize how it is geared towards protein um, electrophoresis in a, a, a better way. So I'll go to the next slide. So first about what are these microfluidic chips? So as we have known, and this technology has matured, especially led by Perkin Emmer, where chips are manufactured on glass or quartz wafer. And this is very important because glass properties and quartz properties are well known among biologists, and it's used by all biotherapeutics world. The second is CADI, where you can load the reagents well. And that is also important because you would like to use uh, reagents of, at, your volume, uh, at the volume you would like to use. 
which is up to 30 microliter, 80 microliters or more. Then it's a sipper, which is also a very important aspect of it, that it sips or it goes, a sipper, sipper is a capillary which goes into your 96, 384 well plate where you have your samples. All what we do is we, we take, communicate with your samples using fluid and analytical actu actuation by electrokinetics or pressure or vacuum flow. The samples are detected via laser-induced fluorescence and we have excitation in this uh, instrument is about 635 nanometer and emission is 700 nanometer. CHIP also have the RFID tags. It basically guides us that how many samples the CHIP has been used and when is the expiration date. This, is, uh, this comes uh, with, the, uh, with the knowledge of that how long the CHIP is going uh, to last in a, in a long run, and that means very, very long run. As you see in the diagram on the top, the channels are isoparametric channels, and there are two junctions shown that the junctions of the channels. These are very repeatable processes, and Perkinhammer is actually worldwide known for making these very precise microchips, not only for Perkinhammer, but for other vendors like Agilent Technologies. Let's go to the next slide. Here I would like to tell overall layout of the chip so we exactly understand what is happening in this assay. So we can actually rationalize our results based on the chip um, uh, layout and chip process. So first thing I want to say is that chip has many wells. As you can see, the reservoirs, some are green colored, some are not colored, and some are red colored. And they are connected via the channels. And I'll go a little bit deeper on that. So we can, on the chip, uh, lowered marker well, which is where we have the marker, which is a lower marker, which is often a dye, which basically tells us that with respect to dye, all uh, relative peaks. Then we have some wells where we put gel, which is nothing but PDMA or polymer gel, and with, along with SPS and dye. And then we have a vacuum well where we apply a pressure to sip up the sample. As you can see, uh, there is a sipper uh, attached to every chip which we get. And I'm showing the zipper with an arrow over here. And then we have actually two uh, channels which are the stain channel, and Jim and I will both go into that a little bit. So what is the unique thing about this microchip, which is very unique to actually this product, is that the chip can function in a high throughput way. That means that its zipper can take as many samples as it wants and do the electrophoresis. That's one. So we don't need many, many 96 capillaries. Only single uh, injection uh, does a, a single chip can take many, many 96 samples. The second is automation, that all electric field and pressure is automated. It's all software driven. So we, even the loading of the gel is automated. So the, the user I just have to click a button and, and all the uh, script basically runs the microfluidic chip and chip re reuse, and which is a very important aspect of the chip. These chips can go many, many places. And because it's glass wafer, we understand glass very well. Glass can be cleaned with the right samples. It, uh, the chip lasts for a very long. So let's go to the next slide where I deep dive into the first step. First step is always injection of a sample or a ladder or a standard. So as you can see that there is a red channel showing the fluid flow. And in this, what happens is that we apply a pressure in, in a well, which I'm showing with the arrow, a vacuum pressure, and it brings the sample to the channel which is showing. It adds the marker to the, with the sample, and it starts flowing. This process uh, takes only a few seconds to do that. What happens is that we bring the sample, sample uh, to the, to the microfluidics chip, and it it, it is ready to be loaded into the gel part of the chip, which is the next step. The, the state of the art is that we only need nanoliter of samples to analyze. And when we go to the next sample, it cleans up the previous sample, and then we inject that. So let's go to the next slide. In the next slide, we do cross-injection. That means we apply uh, electric field between the wells, which I show you arrow. There we apply a negative electrode and in the second well where we apply a positive electrode. And if you do that, the sample which is sitting uh, in this portion of the chip 
injects into the other part of the chip because most of the proteins are uh, negatively charged and they go towards the positively charged. And they go to a cross junction which is shown by a, a circle, a black circle over there. And that's where we are driving it. And this process is very, actually, um, uh, happens only for two seconds or so to move the sample into the cross-sectional area. This is very, very important because here the channel size is roughly 30 to 40 micron. So you can make 30 to 40 micron of plug or, or width of the sample, which is a state of the art for this chip. Because any other uh, uh, techniques, you have to sit with the pressure or using capillaries and the plug size are very, very long. And that has a huge, actually, uh, advantage of these chips that since plug size are small, you can do separation also very, very quick. So that leads to the second chip where we want to actually separate. So here, if you see the channel, I'm going to show you the channel, which is separation channel, which is over here, where the plug which we indicated, which we have in the junction, it, it goes towards the separation channel. What we did in this process, we apply actually the positive electrode here and the negative electrode over this well, and the sample goes towards the power positive electrode. In this process, this plug, which we have the 30 micron plug, is now having all the protein uh, um, fragments, and they start separating, going towards the detection point, as shown in that chip. So since the gel has has the usual characteristics of concentration and molecular weight, and they are optimized for high resolution separation of these proteins. So these uh, proteins are separated by the time they reach. These channels are not that long enough since it's a microfluidic chip. They are not like very long capillaries, and the separation happens in, in the time limits of 10, 60 to 140 seconds. And you will see later on results other competing technologies where we have to wait for 10 minutes and all that. And the reason behind, which is very important to know and often missed by, by most of the scientific community, is that the plug size, which, which is only 30 micron, if we have a very high sensitive detection, we can separate very quickly. Longer plug size will take a longer time to do that, even the sensitivity can go up. That is the very, very important aspect of this. Uh, of this uh, microfluidic chip. There's one more aspect because we have some background coming because we do SDS page or SDS gel electrophoresis. And SDS often grab this hydrophobic dye which we use to decorate this protein. So let's go to the next slide to understand this better. So what is happening is that just before detection, here, here you see in the slide, actually the, on the left side, the whole microchip drawn, redrawn again and you see these stain channels, okay, which, is, uh, uh, which are coming from well number two and well number nine, as I'm showing through this, uh, uh, through my arrows. So what happens during the separation, we apply a current from well number two and well number nine going towards well number 10, which is shown over here with my arrow. So as protein is passing through the separation channel, which is shown over here, going up, then before, just before the detection, as you see in the detection window, they get diluted, so to speak, or de-stained uh, before detection. So what happens is that since there is no SDS in well number two and nine, there are only ionic flow, which makes SDS concentrations go down abruptly. So as you can see down, uh, I'll visualize this, if you see the picture down on the left corner, and I'm showing by the arrow, you can imagine the whole uh, protein and SDS complex is moving and it's getting diluted. What happened that when XDS concentration, SDS is sodium sulfate, which is a surfactant, it makes micelles. And if you decrease the concentration below a certain critical micellar concentration, which is the property, thermodynamic property of this SDS, then it breaks into monomers, like small pieces. So time to free this SDS micelles from when we dilute is about 188 or 200 milliseconds. And that is very, very fast. So that what happens is that protein bound to micelles, which are stronger obviously because protein has more hydrophobic domains, those micelles stay on and the dye is still first. 
where the background fluorescence goes down abruptly. Now, this is shown in our experiments on that, on that figure, which is on the right corner. So when you have no uh, B stain, which is shown the curve, which I'm going to show with arrow over here, you hardly see any peaks because background is very, very high, as you see it's 1,200. But as you keep applying more and more dilution, the stain current or the stain ratio becomes higher, which is shown by DR, you see that at the stain ratio of 14, you start seeing peaks, a very high result peak. So that is actually the uh, the innovation and key innovation in this in this chip that you can dynamically actually uh, create uh, a de-stain of the protein. There is no membrane and washing and manual washing. This is all automated. So that's very very good. We can see the peaks and we can move uh, move towards resolving these proteins. So let's go to the next slide. So what happens is that for uh, for lots of our customers, and almost now all the customers need actually very repeatable results, whether they do the experiments today or tomorrow, or use our first chip or, or the uh, last chip, or, or different users. And as we understand that, that different users may have very small of amount of error in their pipetting or from the refrigerator as a lab bench exercise, they may incur some small errors. And we are talking about really, really small errors, even though we are doing, using very, very uh, accurate poverty. But even if you use very, very small errors, there are some variability is going to come because our concentration or signal are dependent on these variables. So what we have done is we found that we can achieve actually a smart mi microfluidic separations by putting a feedback algorithm, and that's called IntelliChip Feedback Technology, which Perkinamer has developed. So what happens is that we can eliminate any perturbation, which are going to be very small, we understand, but we have to eliminate that by finding out the solution for that. So there are two approaches we have taken, this, we have taken in this IntelliChip Feedback Technology. First is that if there is any which are not going to be, if there are any changes in conductivity of the gel when we apply currents and all that, or the concentration of gel, let's say you're putting a gel, which is the polymer, and if there is small perturbation in concentration there, we basically uh, uh, sip a ladder, and through this sip a ladder, it understands, it calculates all the voltage current equations again, and then apply the, those voltage con concentration cur current equations. Uh, values to these wells or these reservoirs, which leads to the migration time of the ladder peaks to be the same. What it helps is that if I am doing the experiment or if some other person is doing the experiment and if we have little errors in the concentration of the gel or conductivity, it leads to different voltage uh, uh, applied to this and leads to the same arrival time. That is very good. This is how the chip we standardize it first through our voltage uh, current uh, equations. The second part is, as for biotherapeutics, we know that there will be a, uh, uh, there, there will be, if there is a small change in the concentration of SDS or dye, we would like to correct that too, uh, correct that too. And that we, uh, and we are talking about femtomolar variability, so we are, we are going to a very, very high accurate assay here. So when we take two uh, maps, uh, which is monoclonal antibodies, and we ask a question that we would like the ratio of it, which is a standard, to be the same, then we basically uh, take, use this standard and then ensure that, that the map to SDS and map to dye ratios remain constant. And this we achieve by the D-stain, which we talked about in the last slide. So when the D-stain ratio is fixed to keep, make sure that the map to SDS and map to dye ratio is the same, our chip is really standardized now for every customer ready to go for their sample. After that, there is no change. All the chip conditions are fixed, and we go for that. So this is how we basically make sure that IntelliChip technology make, uh, uh, gives us repeatable results, high resolution, accurate sizing, and purity.
And this is all we want to achieve it within 60 to 140 seconds to do that. So let me illustrate uh, two points. As you would understand, what is uh, uh, what? I what if we take a standard from from a from a customer? Before going that, let me show you a real data which we we are trying to talk about. So you see a a plot here where we are plotting the real data where we're changing actually the D-stain ratio and asking a question that we have this value map standard which is a a, a, a big peak uh, which is map one and a small peak which is map two. And we would like to basically see the effect of D-stain ratio as we are we are changing the D-stain ratio and see the effect on this peak ratio. So the question in our hand is because we are providing this, or Prakanemar is providing this, a very map, which is uh, the exact ratio which we are doing it. We can actually achieve that in different uh, chip loads or different region or different, cust uh, different users and ask a question that what D stain ratio I run to get the same purity which we expect because those are the molecules, those are the percentage of molecules we have put in this sample. So as you can see, that once we read this, the software automatically measures this uh, before even we go to the samples in the warming phase, and it plots this curve, which is what is the D-stain ratio and what is the corresponding purity. And if you see that this purity is going down as D-stain ratio. And this is, the, uh, this is the effect basically happening because we are changing the, the map to SDS and map to dye ratio. As you can see that this chip optimizes itself to the purity, which is 10%, and reads off the D-stain ratio. Once it reads off this D-stain ratio, it fixes it for the optimal as the optimal D-stain ratio for the known standard, which is supplied by Perkin Hammer. And then we're ready to go to do that. So let's do some experiments. So the first experiment, obviously, you would think that we should do something which is available as a standard. And what we found that NIST is providing molecular antibodies called NIXMAB. NIST map, and which is index reference material A six seven one, and you can buy it. The good thing about it is that it is a recombinant humanized IgG one K, well characterized by NIST, with the published data, with molecular weight one fifty kilodalton and stock concentration of ten milligram per ml. So what we did is that we got this uh, material, and we thought that let's run it in the, both the devices which we would which we have. One is using ABCIX P800, which is shown on the left, and microfluidic uh, IntelliChip technology, which is GX Touch, shown in the right. So there are two points I would like to highlight. These are non-reduced NIST map. So you see that the baseline is very constant for this IntelliChip feedback technology. However, in, in the left side, the, the waveline, baseline is very wavy. Also, I would like to show that all these peptides which are coming like light chain, heavy chain, light chain, heavy chain, and heavy chain, light chain, as you can see, they are much, they are much better resolved in microfluidics technology. I just want to highlight that left side, the migration times of the order of 24 to 30 minutes, the left side migration times of 30 seconds. So we are having order of magnitude advantage. Let me take you to the other slide, the next slide where we are trying to emphasize on reduced thing, where we want to quantify things. As you can see that we, on the left side, again, ABCI data and right side, right comparison of the same sample of the, of the GX touch data. As you can see that uh, we can resolve all the peaks very well by both technologies. However, lab chip technology takes much uh, shorter time, also very repeatable between users as well as, as uh, between the chips. So this, to summarize, uh, the, uh, these results, I would like to say that we found um, independently that IntelliChip electrophoresis identifies all purity segments with robust measurement of highly reproducible data, which is very important because for each customer like me would like to see the results chip to chip, instrument to instrument, or who is doing it to be the same. And that's the most important part of this IntelliChip electrophoresis. We also would like to emphasize that P800 it takes 20 to 30 minutes per sample, and microfluidics takes only 60 seconds per sample. And we would like to say that we can bracket most of the antibody uh, uh, research or biotherapeutic research using this microfluidics chip. 
With that, I would take the last slide that this software is very, very powerful here. And I don't want to emphasize these things are, are, are done by many companies that we can quantify those percentage purity in all this is automated. And there is no uh, manual uh, work which we have to do, even by taking the peaks or counting the peaks or calculating the area or calculating percentage purity is all done automatically by this software to spit out results in any format we would like. With that, I would like to uh, give uh, the, uh, the presentation to my colleague, uh, Dr. White, to take it from there and tell more about the applications of this uh, microphone chip. Thank you, Anubhav. The goal of uh, my part of the, the second part of the presentation will be to describe the protein assay portfolio and really talk about how we use the technology platform that Anubhav described to, um, to attack uh, and enable you to uh, solve your protein characterization applica applications that are necessary for your lab. I'll also emphasize some more data and um, talk about our new uh, protein clear assay and new developments there. And I'll also talk about the workflow for the protein clear assay and how you are able to use this uh, in your laboratory. So the LabChip GX2 touch platform, as Anubhav said, is a very powerful analytical tool for microfluidic electrophoretic separation of proteins. And we're also able to use this technology for separation of DNA as well. But today we'll be focusing on the, the protein space. And it's able to characterize proteins uh, looking for, for many different critical quality attributes. Uh, some of these attributes include titer, so you can look at concentration and sizing. We focus a lot on purity assessment, and our protein clear assay is really targeted at looking at the percent purity of MABs. We can also look at for aggregation, uh, covalently linked um, aggregates. It can be stability indicated, so very useful for degradation studies and, and MAB and biotherapeutic development and looking at fragmentation analysis. We can look at N-glycan profiling as well and look at charge heterogeneity, so MAB charge variant assay. And then also, if you're looking for uh, purity assessment, there's purity assessment of your main peaks, but then also really um, looking at the fine details of the impurity analysis. So the ability to detect minor impurities of your samples uh, is very important. So our workflows are, are developed to to uh, work using reducing and non-reducing conditions. And we have multiple assays uh, for protein characterization that are aimed to um, work at different stages in your, in your protein product development. Uh, our software presents the results in an electropharogram uh, form, as well as tabular. So we have peak tables and well tables for outputs for all of your um, data outcomes. And then there's also virtual gel formats for your, for your data presentation. So this slide describes um, a product biotherapeutic uh, product pipeline, and there's different stages. So you can have target discovery, clone selection, cell culture, optimization, process development, scale up, and then formulation and safety, and manufacturing and QC. And we really want and develop assays such that we're uh, very useful and provide quality at each step along, along the way of this process. And so if you look at the target discovery and clone selection, we have an N-glycan assay uh, screening and profiling assay that can be used to, to look at the glycan structures uh, of your products. If you move into cell culture optimization, we have the PICO protein assay, which is a covalent uh, assay where we label proteins and is our most sensitive assay. But we also have a low molecular weight protein assay where the assay is optimized to look at low molecular weight proteins and we do quantitation, sizing, and percent purity. And then protein express assay, which is our, our uh, standard and one of our strongest assays, which is, uh, can analyze proteins from 14 kilodaltons to 200 kilodaltons and does quantitation, sizing, and percent purity. In process development, you may, we have a, a charge variant assay. And then now our newest assay is for uh, bioprocess scale up and then extending into the, the QC environment. And that's the new protein clear HR assay. And this can be used for formulation, stability, 
and QC and manufacturing. And by using our IntelliChip technology, we're able to really obtain a high precision and interrun uh, a low CV values uh, so that uh, the, the protein assay can be transferred across sites and the user can be confident in their sizing and percent purity analysis from run to run. Um, and then as you go into manufacturing and QC, you, there may be combinations thereof. So there's the new protein clear HR assay, which is really optimized for MABs and uh, the QC environment and also development environment where uh, percent purity and low, uh, low CVs and the highest precision is needed and traceability back to a standard. If you need low molecular weight analysis, there's the low molecular weight assay or perhaps uh, protein express assay may work for you. So in total, our assays, the, the takeaway there is that we have uh, several, uh, many assays uh, that can be, that are tailor-made for different um, applications and to fit into uh, each stage of your process. So we have one more slide that to detail some of the, the properties for each of the assays in a bit more detail and show them side by side. So as I said, the Protein Express was our uh, base protein assay, and it's used for quantitation, sizing, and percent purity, and is from 14 kilodaltons to 200 kilodaltons, and is our highest throughput assay. So you can, from, from loading and injecting the sample to detection, the run is only 42 seconds per well. We also have an assay that's the low molecular weight protein, where it's similar to the Protein Express, but it's optimized for proteins that are five to 80 kilodaltons. And it takes slightly longer per well, which is 60 seconds per well, but this is to achieve some resolution at the lower molecular weight proteins. And each of all of our, these chip types are reusable for up to 400 samples. Now our new protein clear assay is the, the newest of our, our, in our protein portfolio. And this is really for the formulation, stability, and QC and manufacturing needs. It has increased resolution via a longer uh, separation channel. It also has increased sensitivity and better detection for low level impurities. So we achieved this by an optimization of the dye that we use uh, on board in the chip. So we have better CVs around the lower um, impurity levels. And then the reproducibility, we achieve a better reproducibility and repeatability by using the IntelliJIP features that Anabob described. Uh, with the longer separation channel, it is 65 seconds per well. So still, um, even though a bit longer than Protein Express, it's still very high throughput and especially faster uh, when compared to traditional CE-SDS methods. <coughs> and on the right side is a um, summary of the, the other uh, uh, products I described in our portfolio. So the Pico protein was the covalent labeling assay I mentioned. So here we take time up front to actually label the proteins uh, prior, to load it, prior to separating them on the chip. And the main advantage you get out of the PICO protein is this has our highest sensitivity. So if you need even higher sensitivity than the Protein Express and Protein Clear, you may use the, the PICO protein, which would rival the silver staining sensitivity. Although I'll mention that the Protein Clear um, is quite sensitive and that it is a LIF uh, detection and will go down to five nanograms uh, per microliter. And then we have our glycan profiling and screening, which can screen for N-glycan. Um, and our charge heterogeneity assay that um, works with a PI range from 7 to 9.5 um, and can be used to study the charge of your proteins. So now I'll talk a bit more about our, the newest member of the, the um, protein portfolio, the protein clear assay. And the, the main message is that the Protein Clear HR assay offers the enhanced sensitivity, resolution, and reproducibility for impurity detection and visualization. It's mainly used or developed to be used in process development, the safety and preclinical, and the manufacturing and QC. And it can be used for the characterization, formulation, stability testing, and manufacturing and quality control. The high resolution protein purity assessment enables the detection and visualization of impurities for monoclonal antibody samples. So it's really designed for, for MABs. 
and it uses the and it allows you to obtain confidence in sizing and percent purity with a high degree of intra and interrun reproducibility by using the IntelliChip technology. So for some of the specifications, the percent purity reproducibility for the non-reduced IgG main peak is now less than 0.5%, and it's less than 5% for all of the other uh, impurity peaks. For sizing precision and relative migration time, we report a, a RSD of less than 2%, and we have a very high sensitivity with a lower limit of detection, the LOD of 5 nanogram per microliter for our dynamic labeling and LIF detection. And the end result is really uh, having confidence in the reproducibility of the result. So how do we achieve this improved reproducibility? So we use the IntelliChip assay optimization technology and this automates the assay calibration and optimization. And as Anabob said, it really is designed to mitigate the chip-to-chip -chip and user sample preparation of run-to-run. -run. And it optimizes the voltage and destain ratios through the instrument and chip feedback and the very mad reference standard. So for the destain process, what's happening is that um, as the analytes uh, proceed through the, the separation channel. Uh, we apply electric currents in ch well, channels 2 and 9 to basically electrically dilute the SDS concentration to below the critical micelle concentration. And this eliminates the background fluorescence as Anubhav describes. And we have a, a publication in analytical chemistry that describes this if you're interested to, to learn more about the uh, fundamental research behind this. But with the destaining uh, process, the protein bound micelles remain intact and we're able to uh, detect the proteins with a lower fluorescence value. It's automatically, so how do we automatically adjust the separation voltage and destain currents in real time? So what we do is we, we run a very map sample. So the very map is an IgG reference standard. So we chose IgGs for uh, pharma customers that are developing MABs. So each standard is a MAB, and it, the, the two MABs mix at a precise uh, ratio of 9 to 1. So we know the percent purity of the MAB, and we also know from our ladder the migration time and expected molecular weights of our ladder peaks. So by sipping these peaks, uh, the very MAB sample, with several and sampling several different destaining currents or destaining conditions, we're then able to make the calibration curve and identify the destain ratio that will um, report percent purity to match the reference standard. So if uh, your company has a, a research group or development group at site A and then at site B or across the world, if they use the very map sample uh, with the, your standards, you should expect reproducibility and repeatability of your, of your results. And the overall microfluidic separation is much smarter and has a built-in calibration and optimization. So it enables the optimal run performance for the inter as well as the inter-run reproducibility in the percent purity and the molecular weight sizing. So how does the assay work when you, when you bring the, the uh, protein clear HR assay into the laboratory? And perhaps some of the listeners are, are protein express users. So it starts for you. You'll take the reagent kit out of the fridge and you'll warm the uh, reagents up for 30 minutes. We do this to uh, bring the dye to room temperature as well as the other reagents, but the dye is in DMS O, so we need to make sure this is thawed and completely mixed, and that's very important for, for our technology. Um, and then you can proceed to prepare your sample plate and your chip. Um, so you prepare your gel and mix it with the dye and then load this onto the caddy and then you prepare your chip. Um, and during this time you prepare the very MAB um, IgG standard. So this IgG standard, we run it in the non-reducing condition. And so we denature and then run this as a sample. And then you can uh, place the chip in the instrument with your um, plate with your very MAB sample and then we calibrate on the very MAB sample. And then during this calibration time, it's a one-hour procedure. 
or process um, where the ladder is sipped and the very map uh, percent purity standard is sipped using uh, multiple de-stain conditions and we identify the uh, electrical conditions, so the voltage and the de-staining current such that the ladder peaks arrive at, the, at our set uh, standard arrival time and also the de-staining is set such that the percent purity um, of the de-staining condition uh, is normalized to the very map standard. Now during this uh, calibration time, you are able to uh, process and, and denature and make your other samples, or you can run it where you make very map in your samples at the same time and then insert this into the chip, into the instrument, and, and press start. Um, the script will run um, up to multiple times in order to obtain a set of parameters to provide the best performance and reproducibility. And in the case where there may be a user error where it, it does not uh, calibrate or there was a mistake in pipetting and it's not able to calibrate, uh, the instrument will report a, a warning message to the user that the optimized conditions were not achieved and then one can, um, one can start over and then, and then calibrate the instrument. Uh, one thing about the protein clear assay is that the calibration protocol must be run prior to the sample run as that is really how it's designed to, to meet the specifications for the intra and the interrun um, uh, uh, specifications. So to show a bit more data uh, about the reproducibility, so shown here are some uh, uh, CV values for um, different samples, so IgG non-reduced main peak, a uh, reduced heavy chain, a non-glycosylated heavy chain, and a reduced heavy chain. And we see intra-run and inter-run CVs. So for each of, these, each of these peaks that you see data for, um, they were sipped, we made a master plate, and they were, each sample was sipped 24 times during a run. And the run was, uh, we did nine different runs. And across those nine different runs, we had uh, three different users, uh, five different chips, and five different instruments. So it's quite a uh, quite diverse set there for, for varying the conditions to challenge ourselves. And you can see for our sizing and our percent purity CVs. So for the intra run, our sizing specification is 2%, and we're coming in about 0 0.4 to 0.5%. And similarly, intra run for the percent purity, we want to be less than 0.5% for the main non-reduced IgG and you can see that we're safely clear of that at 0.14%. And our other peaks are also within our 5% specification. But we're really excited about the interrun CV, and in which we're also able to decrease the, or to lower those to very, um, very good uh, CV values. So similarly, our sizing is less than the 2%, as well as our um, uh, percent purity specifications, which are less than 0.5% and 5% for the main peak and the impurity peaks, respectively. We have a resolution spec. So shown here on this slide is for the very map where we're setting it to a, a value indicating that our percent purity standard, that each of those peaks are baseline resolved, so that when you use that standard, um, even though they're both maps, they're baseline resolved, such that we have a good calibration for the percent purity and a linear concentration range from 10 to 1,000 nanograms per microliter. The LOD of this assay is 5 nanogram per microliter, and the linearity is, um, is very strong, so greater than 0 0.995. And shown here is a zoom in of the um, of a non-reduced peak, and you can really see um, the impurity detection uh, of the protein clear assay. So you can see a um, a clip, and you can see some of the different um, different impurity, heavy, heavy light, uh, and some of the other impurity peaks that are important for the, the researcher to identify uh, in the biotherapeutic environment. So with that, um, the protein clear assay um, is really designed to provide high resolution protein purity assessment and enable the detection and visualization of impurities within a MAP sample. It's developed for maximum precision because we're in sizing and percent purity, 
And we do this with the IntelliChip and the very mad percent purity reference standard and calibrating each assay and adjusting the, the electrical conditions um, to normalize against the standard. Um, and then also is able to have enhanced resolution compared to the Protein Express assay, um, uh, enabling you to um, uh, have better characterization of your impurities. Uh, the IntelliChip assay optimization is novel, uh, and it offers the real-time assay calibration. Um, and the VeriMap IgG reference standard provides a reference calibration and also provides uh, traceability uh, for your characterization. So with that, I would like to uh, thank our audience uh, very much, and Anubhav and I welcome any questions. Excellent presentations, Dr. Tripathi and Dr. White. Thanks for bringing that information to us. So before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many as we can. And our first question is? Dr. White, this first question is for you. Are there any common troubleshooting issues that a user should be aware of? Yes, from our uh, experience, we know that there, there are several things and uh, uh, troubleshooting that can be performed to give the optimal assay performance. One is kind of upfront, is that we emphasize with customers to have really good and, uh, pipetting technique, especially when it's going uh, across sites. This can make a difference in using the reverse pipetting for the viscous gel mixtures. Cleanliness of the instrument is, is quite important. Uh, making sure to clean it and purge the um, instrument line. So there's a purge function on the instrument. So our R&D group does this really routinely and uh, pays a lot of attention to this because we are applying the, the currents and voltages um, to tune the destain channels. And so if, um, if cleanliness falls off and current leaks start, then we have to troubleshoot and get the instrument back to working order. But really with good cleanliness and good pipetting technique, um, should be in good shape. We know one of the important steps also is the thawing and preparing the mixture of the gel dye um, mixture. Um, this is important such that the, the dye ratio and concentration is delivered properly on ship. And so we know it's important to really slow down and adhere to the uh, mixing procedure that's outlined in our, in our user guide where you invert the two multiple times and vortex it for the full time. If, if that step is done uh, hastily, um, one may result in dips or a mislabeling, and then that really just comes back to an improper gel dye formulation. So if we pay attention to the cleanliness of the instrument, the purging, or the critical step of formation of the gel dye, that gets the instrument set up. And then for protein clear, um, if one observes a little artifact in the baseline, while we don't, um, during our validation and R&D, we don't take any steps during our test procedures, um, and we don't see that often in, in our hands. If one uh, does see those, that's very important, we know for the, the QC customer. Because the instrument is quite high throughput, one can run uh, PBS blanks um, and kind of recondition the chip and then, and then collect additional samples. So those are, are some of the, the common things that uh, have come up and, and could be helpful for customers to know. Thank you. Next one is for Dr. Chapathi. Uh, how does it stand up against something like the Beckman PA-800? Yeah, that's a good question. I think what we observed during the experiments in both the instruments, uh, that uh, first, uh, the time it takes in Beckman 800 both for the uh, preparing for uh, Beckman experiments as well as time to take assay is quite long. Um, so it's about 10 minutes and, and, and uh, sometime many, many uh, minutes before preparation time. In terms of uh, using the slab chip uh, uh, GX-Touch, uh, preparation time is very, very small because uh, of an, this instrument, uh, Prakinema instrument, basically pushes the gel, loads, loads everything, and gets the chip ready. And quite uh, amazingly, the assay, as we shown in the results in, in this uh, webinar, 
uh, uh, we take only 60 to 140 seconds to finish uh, the experiments, typically around 60 seconds to do that. That's a quite a big movement. The other technical uh, part is uh, is the baseline. And as uh, when we did NIST map, uh, we found that the uh, results uh, were quite, uh, baseline was quite wavy for B800, where we found actually GX touch was quite um, stable. And that's important because determination of percentage purity actually um, is sometime baseline resolution. The other thing is that uh, we want to emphasize uh, is that that the uh, NIST map was very standard and we knew what is the percentage purity and both B800 and GX touch uh, got same data reproducible uh, in the, both, the, both the instrument. So, but the key factor is the GX touch got the same data, reproducible data, SP800, but in much, much shorter time. It's about 30, or oh, sorry, 60 seconds. So that I could highlight is, is a key advantages of uh, lab chip GX. There's one more very important. I don't know about B800 uh, inside algorithm and all that, but we do know, as, as we are presenting in the webinar, that lab chip GX test touch system actually taking care of small errors and with this IntelliChip technology. So those errors have to come in the case, in the user, in different places in the world, and this is forward looking. It's like going, you know, five, ten years from now, these assays will become popular where a uh, system takes care of, uh, of uh, the errors coming through um, uh, unknown factors. And that is very, very smart about it. Uh, Dr. White, next one is for you. In what format is data ex exported from the instrument, and is this designed for QC laboratories? Yes, so uh, electropharograms, the eGrams, the gel images, as well as the peak tables and well tables, and the peak tables and well tables containing information on your sizing, percent purity, concentration, height, all those uh, important outcomes uh, may be exported. Um, they're analyzed in the, the reviewer, LabChip reviewer software. They can be exported in a CSV file. So you can take those to Excel, or you can also take those to, as an AIA file. Uh, that's important, especially with design for, for QC customers, because if, if your laboratory uses Empower or Chromelion, that data format may be uh, used on, on those platforms, and you can process the, the raw data. For the QC laboratories, we also have a, a GXP patch that you can put on the uh, software. And basically what this does is it, it uh, uh, allows um, the laboratory to set up control over user access and, and gives different user passwords uh, and, and um, uh, controls what they're allowed to adjust on the instrument. So once your method is locked and you have an operator that will be doing QC, they'll be able to log in and only um, run the assay. Uh, so with those things in mind, that's how it, it was designed for the data export uh, for the uh, process development and the QC laboratory. Great, next one is for Dr. Trapathy. Do your assays have a ladder with a high molecular weight peak to bracket monoclonal antibodies? Uh, what's the question? Sorry. Can you repeat? Can you repeat, please? Uh, yes. Do your assays have a ladder with a high molecular weight peak to bracket monoclonal antibodies? Uh, yes, uh, indeed. We have actually um, uh, the ladder. Actually, this assay is designed to, uh, to bracket uh, most of the antibodies uh, investigated by biosynthetic scientific community. So yes, it, this assay is taken care of that. In fact, it's optimizing around uh, that uh, MAV, which is called VeriMAV, it's standard which is uh, designed around those uh, uh, available or, uh, antibodies. And, and, and you can add. Yeah. If I can just add to that, so the, the protein clear assay has a, a ladder peak at 250 kilodaltons, and that peak was introduced to bracket a normal MAB uh, molecular weight around 150. So that is a feature of our newer, the newest um, protein clear assay. Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Tapasi and Dr. White for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? 
No, we would just like to thank everyone for um, listening to the webinar. We're very excited about the, the new technology and to continue the, the R&D at uh, Perkin Elmer. And we appreciate all of the questions. And as more come in through the um, on-demand features, we look forward to answering those and getting back to you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I would also like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2018. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thanks for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. We will see you next time.